Section 1 You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call, but Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Ken says that they need accommodation from the 10th to the 22nd of July. So, the 10th to the 22nd of July has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken. Nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call, but Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M-O-O-N-F-L-E-E-T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds OK. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes, then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm, it's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752-669-218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags, problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's OK, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear Jane Hemington talking about this year's summer festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening. And in this week's edition of Focus on the Arts, Jane Hemington is going to fill us in on what's in store for us at this year's Summer Festival. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, this year, the Summer Festival is the biggest we've ever seen, so there should be something for everybody. This is the third year they've run it, and the timing's slightly different. For the last couple of years, it's been around the 5th to 17th, but this year, they wanted to allow everyone enough time to recover from the 1st of January celebrations, and they've put it at the end of the month. The program has sensational theater, dance, and also a large number of art exhibitions. But the thing the festival is most famous for is its great street music. For today's report, though, Jeffrey, I'm looking at some of the theatrical events that you might like to see. In particular, at this year's theme, circuses. I'm going to uh, tell you about two circus performances, but there are plenty of others in the program. I've chosen these because they represent distinct movements within circus performance. The first is the Circus Romano from Italy. As this is a traveling circus, it follows a long tradition by performing in a marquee, which is really like a canvas portable building, usually put up in a green space or car park rather than in a theater or stadium. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. In spite of this, Circus Romano isn't at all like the traditional circuses I grew up with. 
There are no animals, just very talented clowning and acrobatic routines. The show has a lot of very funny moments, especially at the beginning. But the best part is the music and lighting. They're magical. At forty-five dollars, it's very expensive anyway.、Uh, it's really for adult tastes. In fact, much of it would be wasted on children. So I suggest you leave them at home. The second circus performance is Circus Electrica at the Studio Theater. The purists are suggesting that this isn't a circus at all. It's a showcase for skills in dance and magic, rather than the usual ones you expect in a circus. With only six performers, it's a small production which suits the venue well. The studio only seats about two hundred people. For my money, it's the aerial displays which are outstanding, as well as the magical tricks, features which are missing from Circus Romano.、Uh, an interesting feature of the show is that the performers are so young. The youngest is only fourteen, but it's still well worth seeing. A good one for the whole family. And finally, as it's summer, you may wish to see some of the festival performances that are being presented outdoors, like the famous Mekong Water Puppet Troupe performing in the city gardens this week. Now, water puppetry is amazing. It's large puppets on long sticks, controlled by puppeteers standing waist deep in the lake. The puppets do comedy routines, and there is some terrific formation dancing. This is a fantastic show, and the best moment comes at the end, seeing the puppeteers. When the troupe walks up out of the water, you get this amazing feeling. It's really hard to believe that what you've been watching is lifeless wood and cloth. As an adult, I had a great time, but I did note that other older people in the audience weren't quite as taken with it as I was. It's a must for young children, though, and that's the audience it's really aimed at. Well, that's all I've time for today. But I'll be back next week with more news of what's worth seeing and what it's best to miss. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three on page two hundred and three. Section three. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five on page two hundred and three. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Okay, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic: wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional because I don't see it on the requirements list. Okay, we should start planning our class presentation since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, 
but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30 on page 204. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right, and we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly because those things just stress the bird. Yes, it's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on cochlear implants. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The topic for today's lecture is cochlear implants, which are a relatively new form of technology for assisting people who are profoundly deaf. First, let's revise how normal hearing works. If you look at image 1, you will remember that the ear has three sections. The outer ear, or pinna, picks up sounds which are then channeled through the ear canal to the eardrum, where they are transformed into mechanical vibrations. These are sent to the cochlea, or inner ear. Inside this snail-shaped tube, 
there are sensory hearing cells that have a variety of functions. The outer hair cells make soft sounds louder and reduce the volume of louder sounds. The inner ear cells transfer this information to the auditory nerve and thence to the brain, which interprets the input as sounds. This sophisticated and sensitive process allows us to process a huge variety of auditory input. For those who are profoundly deaf, the system functions poorly or not at all, and the brain does not receive the input it needs to process and interpret sounds. Image 2 shows how a cochlear implant works. You can see that the implant has three main parts. The first external part, behind the ear itself, is the microphone, and at the back of this you can see its associated speech processor, which is a tiny computer. This analyzes and digitizes sounds and sends them to the transmitter, which is worn on the head. Those sounds need to be converted into electrical impulses so that they can be sent to the cochlea. If you look carefully at the image, you can see that just under the skin, directly behind the transmitter, is a surgically implanted receiver. This receives the sounds from the transmitter. It converts these sounds into electrical impulses, which are sent directly to an electrode array that is implanted inside the cochlea itself thus completely bypassing the ear canal. As you have seen, a cochlear implant does not operate in the same way as the ear, nor, in fact, as a hearing aid. In cases of mild hearing loss, hearing aids can be very helpful. They simply amplify the normal sound waves as they travel down the ear canal. However, they generally cannot overcome severe hearing difficulties, and this is where cochlear implants come into play. So, what are the pros and cons of using a cochlear implant? Well, firstly, cochlear implants can deliver significant improvements in hearing for some users, and some people report dramatic improvements in the perception of individual words and sentences over the weeks and months after an implant. However, a cochlear implant is not a magic bullet that works equally well for all users. The sound signals that the brain receives from an implant are quite different from normal ones, and this means that the user has to relearn how to hear. Many users report that speech sounds robotic after a cochlear implant, and the degree to which people can adjust to this new kind of hearing varies hugely with each user and situation. It is important to understand that a cochlear implant is not a cure for deafness and that the user is still deaf, especially for a child an implant is a long-term commitment, involving lengthy and intensive training. The user must learn to reinterpret sounds and will likely need to augment this with speech therapy so that people in the community can easily communicate with them. The implants work much better in quiet situations than in noisy ones, so they still need to learn to lip-read and to use sign language. The surgery itself is not without risk, though it has greatly improved since it was first performed, and there is some possibility of damage to facial nerves. Another disadvantage of a cochlear implant is that the surgery may remove any natural hearing that the deaf person still retains. This takes away the possibility of using a hearing aid should the implant not be effective. For this reason, many users have implant surgery performed on only one ear the one with the least natural hearing. So, who is best suited to receiving an implant? Many factors impact on this decision. The most significant one appears to be the duration of the deafness, and, as you would expect, those who have been deaf for a long time generally have lower success rates. The second related factor is how old the patient was when they became deaf, and maybe more significantly, whether they had learned to speak before they became deaf. Those who become deaf postlingually generally have better outcomes. Another factor is the health and structure of the cochlea and how many nerve cells the user retains. This is related to the cause of the hearing loss, and recent research is exploring how the spinal ganglion, or nerve cells, are affected by disease. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.